Good morning. This is Sunday School. Acts chapter 16, part who knows. We don't even keep track anymore. I just, one day we'll get these posted on YouTube. So <clears throat> we did a uh, Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we ha- we're going to try to get those posted here soon, too. Doing an open question and answer for the next probably uh, eight weeks or so. Uh, pretty much you bring whatever question you have about the Bible, about the worldview, whatever you want to do, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, so that's been pretty fun. Trying to get some guys coming back in who haven't been in a while. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter number 16. And we're going to look today at uh, the conversion of Lydia <clears throat> on the Sabbath day. Acts chapter number 16. Heard a really good song this week. Not really a Christian song, but it's a song by the guy named Luke Graham. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, it's a song called Seven Years. And a really good song. Uh, interesting because it, it kind of falls in the philosophy of, you know, life is short. And as you listen to it, you go, I mean, the guy gets it. You know, he basically says, soon I'll be seven years old. Soon I'll be 11 years old. Soon I'll be 30 years old. Soon I'll be 60 years old, you know. And basically kind of like a reflection of life. And I, I find that very interesting. And the more I talk with people who are, you know, aged, as you can use that word, uh, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, what their, what, their, what their thought process is about the next couple of years and if they're going to make it. All right, so the baptism of Lydia here and her conversion, we'll look at that. Acts chapter 16, and uh, go in verse number 12. It says, And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia in a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. <clears throat> and she was baptized and her household. She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. A lot of people have problems with what takes place in the book of Acts after they're introduced to the basics of dispensational Bible thought and Bible teaching. They look at the book of Acts and they go, well, hold on, Paul did this. And hold on, there's this weird thing here. Hold on, there's this. And, and so they, they look, unfortunately, at the framework of dispensational Bible truth and go, well, there's no variations. It's just it's concrete, cut and dry, black and white every time, right? And so you go, well, not exactly because it's not. And we see a lot of examples of that. And we, we gave some of them the other day, but, but here's, here's another case in point here in Acts chapter number 16 and verse number you know, 14 and 15. So let's talk a little bit about what's taking place here. So Lydia, of course, is an is a individual who, who Paul is going out to, to you know, worship with along with other people because it's the Sabbath day. Are we on the Sabbath today, today worshiping? No, you know, we don't, we don't go on the Sabbath day, you know, Friday at sun, sunset to, to Saturday at sunset, you know, that whole thing. We, don't, we just don't do that, right? We don't, we don't practice or worship God on the Sabbath day. But who does do that? The Jews were those individuals who for a long time practiced that. And, and anybody who were proselytes or converts to Judaism or any Gentiles who would be with Jews, they would be required if they're going to live among the Jews to partake in the Jewish holidays because we're not going to allow, when I use the word holidays, I mean holy days, we're not going to allow the non-Jewish individuals, the Gentiles, to uh, corrupt the non you know, uh, to corrupt the Jews, right? So the Sabbath day, what, what is it? Why, why is Paul doing this? Well, Paul's been doing this for his whole life, okay? His whole life has been about the Sabbath day, okay? Every Sabbath day, that is what he would go and do. He would do what? He would go down to the synagogue. And so clearly here in Acts chapter 16, there's no synagogue for them to worship in because they're in, as it says here, from thence to Philippi, which is chief city of that part of Macedonia, in a colony, so it's part of the Roman you know, Empire, and we were in that city abiding certain days, so days pass by, and what takes place? Well, the Sabbath day comes, and when the Sabbath day comes, what are you going to do? Well, Paul's probably going to continue on in what he's been doing for a long time, and part of his tradition was to go into the Sabbath day, and do, into the synagogues, and do what with the individuals? He would go in there and, and, and really be like, oh, guest speaker time. You know, remember the, the verse that says, if any man have any manner of exhortation, say on, right? It's the same thing like that. So Paul would come in on the Sabbath day and just, boom, just deliver the goods. And people would be like, oh, my goodness, what, 
what is this? This is crazy. And it's a, it's a continuation of what Jesus Christ did in his earthly ministry. Same thing. Jesus Christ would go into the synagogues on the Sabbath day as his custom and as his manner was. And he would read the letters and teach like in Luke chapter number four. And he would blow people's minds. They would be like, who is this guy? Right? Where did he come from? How does he know all of these things? And same thing goes with what Paul would do. And Paul would grant to them that clarification. So as I was saying at the beginning... People learn dispensational Bible truth. And, of course, the dispensational word comes with so much baggage and so many things. It's like, it's so hard. It's, it's like the, uh, it's like to tell people that you're, oh, I'm libertarian. Oh, well, that means this, you know, that you're against the government and you're an anarchist. And it's like, no, not necessarily. You see how there's all the baggage. Like, I'm a Democrat. Well, you know what that means, right? I'm a Republican. You know what that means. I like the giants. Well, you know what that means, right? Anything like that, they have baggage that's associated. So, so does dispensational Bible thought. So what most people do is they learn the basics of dispensational truth. But then the difficult verses or what are considered to be the, the verses, okay, why would Paul allow for the baptism of Lydia here? That's, that sounds crazy. You know, that, that, how, why does that happen? You know, they can't, they can't reconcile it. So what do they do? They either just dismiss it and, and just be like, ah, it's not really that big of a deal. Or what, what else do they do? They just skip it. They don't bother reading it. They just like, ah, we're just going to avoid it. Avoid that one. Avoid that passage. We don't want to have to explain it. So let's avoid it. I don't think we should avoid anything when it comes to the scripture. And I think we should spend time on every verse going, okay, look, it's not that big of a deal, right? People get all up in arms about it. So let's talk a little bit about why I believe that Lydia is a Jewish proselyte, okay? Why I believe she's, she's worshiping on the Sabbath day, what that means, who is with Paul, that is to say his companions right now in the ministry, which is a guy by the name of Silas. And we'll talk about really the, the, the principle and the meaning and the history behind the Sabbath day. And then we'll look at today. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare and contrast Two, really two things, three things total. I'm going to compare and contrast the, the Sabbath day, right, present to, to, to days of old. I'm going to compare and contrast the issues of, of circumcision, past to present. I'm going to compare and contrast then the law, past and present, and bring that full circle to the issues of baptism, past and present. Okay. So when you talk about the issue of baptism today, and we say there's really no need or necessity for you to be, to, to be water baptized, and people scream and shout and get all up in arms how dare you how do you know and, and you start to ask them well do you have you ever read, ever read these passages do you know what this means and have you ever read this they don't really care they just know that they've been taught a specific way they're going to maintain that 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 thought process and to say otherwise is heresy and damnation so what you can do in helping people is say well you don't go to you don't worship on the sabbath day anymore do you and they go, well, no, I don't. Well, well, why not? I mean, Scripture explicitly states that you should be worshiping on the Sabbath day. Well, we just don't do that anymore. Well, do you practice the ritual of circumcision then? Well, no, not necessarily. You know, well, why not? Did you circumcise on the eighth day? Because if you didn't circumcise on the eighth day, I'm pretty sure you did the day that he was born. And, I mean, that doesn't count. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no. So why didn't you follow the, the teaching of God? Do you not believe in the teaching of God then? Oh, well, well, I mean, I do. I, I mean, I do believe in the teaching. Like, well, it doesn't sound like it. So far, you're, you're, you're zero for two, right? You see how that you can, you can prove the point by using things that are in the Scripture that are there to, to, as an example. Same thing goes with the Law of Moses. You can use the entire Law of Moses and say, so you don't, you, you believe and keep the Law of Moses? Oh, absolutely, the Law of Moses is, 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 is necessary every day. Ten Commandments are necessary every day. Sure, you really believe that? Do you, do you keep that today? Do you live your life by the Ten Commandments? Oh, I do. Absolutely, I do. And then you can go through some of them. And then same thing goes with, as we'll look at the end, the teachings of, of the end of Matthew chapter 28, when Christ says, you know, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, right? And so what they'll do is they say, see, baptism is necessary. And I said, that's fine. Now let's take everything else he taught to that you're not doing, right? So you can't pick and choose the pieces that you want to do or the pieces that are convenient for you, you must do them all. So if he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, right, and lo, I'm with you, you have to do all those things. So the compare and contrast is to go back to the, the, the principles of what, what it means and then go to present day. Don't you realize that the entire, you know, I issue of, of circumcision was to, was to teach us something, right? Do you, do, you, do you see that it wasn't about the cutting of the foreskin? It was never about that, right? And you realize you go through and you go, oh, wow, that, that does make a lot of sense, right? Same thing goes with the water baptism. The water baptism isn't the, 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 the washing away of the filth of the flesh. It's not the washing away of your sins. It's the, it's the type. It's the picture of what it really means in the spiritual sense, right? 
So same thing, and, and we're gonna we're gonna look at, at, at the law too. But backing up to, to baptism once more, as I said last week, that that Satan has corrupted really a handful of, of words. Okay, and the, the the three words that I think he's corrupted more than anything, I believe he's corrupted the word church. Okay, to be a building, to be a place that you go and do things, as opposed to being the body of Christ. I believe he's corrupted the word prayer in that he's taken prayer to be bow your heads, close your eyes, a certain thing that you do, and that is prayer, right? The stations of the cross and your rosaries and all those things that you do. That's the prayer part, but then your day-to-day -day life is not prayer, which we understand that to pray without ceasing means there's a constant communion with God, that God, that Jesus Christ liveth evermore on the right hand of God and constantly makes intercession on our behalf, right? And then the third thing he's used is he's taken the word baptism and he's taken that word and made it synonymous with water. And he's used that very He's used that very well to the, to the extent that people have now believed that unless they are water baptized, unless they are physically water baptized with their nasty, dirty flesh, that they do not receive justification. Can I tell you that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard? It's just, it's, 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 not, it's not scripturally based. It doesn't there. Well, Hall, oh, you've never read Acts 2.38. No, I have, and we're going to talk about it today. I have probably 10 sermons we've preached on Acts 2.38. So those, those verses, let's, let's go into these and talk about more detail. So look at Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 23. Exodus chapter 16, verse number 23. So the Sabbath day actually came prior to the law, okay? In the creation of the world, God made the world in how many days? Six days, right? Everybody always says seven. I'm like, no, it's actually six. It's good. So he made it in six days, right? And on the seventh day, what happened? He rested, right? So it's prior to that. What you're going to see is you're going to see this, you know, kind of come full circle here into the beginning of the law of Moses as a time and teaching point where he says in Acts chapter 16, verse number 23, and he says, <clears throat> and he said unto him, this is that what the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake to the uh, bake that which you will bake today, and see that you will see, and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it. Right? But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. I'm going to clarify this in just a second, but notice that word, what it says. See, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath. As we're going to see in just a second, the Sabbath... Right? Was made for who? Made for man. So look what he says. Therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on what? On the seventh day. Turn with me over the book of Exodus as well. Verse number 20. Chapter 20 and verse number 8. Part of the Ten Commandments as we read in Exodus chapter number 20. Includes the Sabbath day. So when people will say, I keep the Ten Commandments, you say, well, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And they say, I do. I go to church on Sunday. They say, that's not the Sabbath day. Well, it doesn't really matter. Well, no, it absolutely does matter, right? It's the specific day that God has set aside. So if you're going to go back to the law, then you must keep it in its true and pure form. Not how you decide to interpret it. Well, I just pick a day and I consider that to be the Sabbath day and that's sufficient and fair enough, right? Well, no, it doesn't work like that. If God said to circumcise you on the eighth day, then you do it on the eighth day. You don't go, well, I'm kind of busy on the eighth day. Let's do it on the fifth day. That would be what? That would be disobedience. That would be contrary law. That would be an offense. So in Exodus chapter 20, in verse number 8, he says this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days. No, notice he doesn't just stop there. <clears throat> he goes on to say, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. 
In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now notice this, right? He's going to show you that this has been going on, and this was a picture back from the creation of the world. He says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So that's four verses, you know, five, really five verses, almost, almost five verses of text regarding the Sabbath day. So the other ones like, thou shalt know the gods before me, okay, you don't have to go as far. Uh, things like, honor thy father and mother, that's pretty easy. One verse, thou shalt not kill, it's one sentence, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery, it's one sentence, right? Go with me one more chapter over, to, or go, two couple chapters over, go to Exodus chapter 31, look at this one. <coughs> Exodus chapter 31 and verse number, uh, look at 14. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it, here's the, here's the punishment for not keeping the Sabbath day, shall surely be put to death. Oh, yikes. Anybody practicing that today? No, not at all. And do you know anybody that's ever been put to death for not keeping the Sabbath day? It's never occurred, right? Well, that sounds like some ISIS stuff. Recently, there was a video that was going around some Scandinavian country and some guys took passages of the Bible. And, you know, because there's big hate against Islam and Muslims right now, which actually is well warranted, but, you know, against their evilness and their, and their wickedness. But he takes the, the Bible and he takes just little bits and pieces out of, you know, certain battles and certain things and, and will read it and go, you know, oh, can you believe what, you know, what, these, what these, they teach in the Quran? And they're like, oh, that's crazy. You know, and he goes to all these different people. He does like 20 different people. But, you know, you love the Bible, right? Oh, I love the Bible. The Bible doesn't have anything in there about violence. No, no, there's no violence in the Bible. None, none. It's, it's all real good stuff. It's all happy stuff. And, you know, he'll quote a verse and he'll say, you know, as the Lord thy God loves you, love one another. You know, some, some other version or something. But, you know, he's quoting. He says, that's the Bible, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And then he reads the other one. This is the Quran. But they're both verses from the Bible, right? And so I find it so amusing that people who are like, and they're like, oh, I'm Christian, I'm Christian, I'm Christian, I'm Christian, I'm Christian. And then they read those verses for the first time, and then they go, <gasps> and then after, you know, he drops the bomb on them and says, well, actually, all those verses are from the Bible, right? And, you know, some people do. Some people, like, they're freaking out. They're like, well, how, how, how do I do? What do I do? How do I answer that? How, how does that even work? What do I do? You know? And they have zero answer for it. And I see some people, some of the guys in the video were like, oh, I'm not a Christian anymore if that's in the Bible. And I'm like... Wow, well, you didn't really hold your faith too much in, 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 in respect or revere. But so, you know, on that whole issue, I, I'm going to briefly just, just a summation of this so in case people talk to you about it. <clears throat> I'm not getting political on you, but you should understand that, that in, in accordance to Islam, it is mandated to them, right, through their scripture. It's mandated to them for violence, okay? It's mandated, meaning that it's not, it's not optional. So the concept behind a moderate Muslim, right, is a farce. A moderate Muslim is not a true practicing Muslim. They're, they're lying, right? They're saying, oh, yeah, I keep the Ten Commandments when they don't, right? Oh, I follow the Sermon on the Mount just like a Christian. I do all those things, but they don't, right? The true adherents, those individuals, the, ex the extremists, as they want to detail, are not really the extremists, okay? Those are the ones who are truly practicing and following the religion as it's supposed to be taught, right? Does that make sense? So those individuals who are the moderates or, or those individuals who kind of quasi-practice it, well, they're not really good Muslims, okay? The good Muslims, and I use the word good in the sense as if they're actually practicing it to the way it's supposed to be done and according to the Quran, not good in the sense that it's morally, you know, uh, laudatory or, or should be worthy of praise. But good Muslims are those who are the extremists, who are, you know, uh, actively, you know, going forward with jihad and, and actively going out and killing the infidel. I mean, that is a good Muslim. So the, 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 the process behind, as they'll say, you know, uh, and again, I, I am not a political uh, individual by any stretch of the imagination, but you've heard recently that Donald Trump got in a lot of hot water for saying that he should ban all the Muslims. Well, frankly, that's, that's, that's been, it's really not that ridiculous of a statement, okay? It's just, it's just really not. But let me, let me, let me wrap this full circle for you so you can see it, okay? Just stay with me for a second. 
This is, this is how ridiculous our, our, the, the Christian world is, especially the Southern Baptists and Baptists who are, you know, the evangelical fundamentalists who are, who are the most politically, you know, zealots out there. But when you, when you look at what, what he had said, and that is to, to get all the Muslims out, that, that's, been, that's been enabled for a long time. I mean, when you had, when you had Hitler and, and, and the Nazis, I mean, they're like, okay, anybody that's a proponent of that stuff, yeah, they're not allowed to, you know, to immigrate to the United States. We're not going to let any of those Nazis in here. We do not want them to be here. I mean, you know, the Nazism is really a religion. I mean, it's really what it is. And so they even hide behind the guise of Christianity and, and other things. So same thing goes with skinheads. Many skinheads are, you know, Christians, so to speak, right? So they'd say that, that's, that's hate. We're not going to lot. We're not going to bring it in. Now, if you think about that, that that's, that's not that ridiculous. But what are the, what are the, what are the Baptists and the, the, the major Christian denominations standing up for? They're standing up for a concept known as religious freedom, okay? Or religious expression, right? Can I assure you that Jesus Christ does not care about religious freedom? Can I absolutely assure you he doesn't? He doesn't care. He's not into religious freedom, okay? He's not into religious liberty. He doesn't care about any of that stuff, okay? The first and primary reason that he doesn't care about it is because the, the, the liberty that he gives you is, is, cannot be taken from a man, okay? You don't get your liberty from the government. You get your liberty from being in Christ. So the liberty that people are talking about in this freedom of religion and freedom of expression, see what they unfortunately have to do is, as they say, well, America, the land of the free, we must defend the fr freedom of religion. And I actually started to think about this. There's big associations. The Christian Law Association is one of them. You guys are familiar with them? I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, the, 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 the Christian Legal Council, which is the subset of those guys. A bunch of these other ones that have come out. And what are they doing? Well, they're standing up for religious freedoms. And the more I thought about that, I said, well, that's really perverse. Because as, as we think about it, do you think in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ there will be religious freedom? I mean, think about it. In the, in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, is there going to be like, oh, the Buddhist and the Mormon and the Muslim and the, and the Hindu, yeah, they can, all, they can all worship whoever they want to worship. I'm pretty sure the scripture says, in that day there shall be one Lord, right, and his name one. Okay? It's only one. So the, the farce about that, that somehow we need to stand up for religious freedom actually is quite sinful. It is. To stand up and say, we need to stand up for religious freedom. And I, I, I posed the question to several guys who are constitutional lawyers who I'm friends with, and I asked them that. Christian constitutional lawyers. And I asked them, I said, look, dude, I, I said, how could you stand for religious freedom? Because I'm pretty sure, and he goes, well, we just, we just have to. I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a government that's going to be set up on the earth that there's going to be absolutely no separation of church and state, right? The concept that, they, that you can't have a, 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 a religion that's, that's, that's governed by the government or endorsed by the government. Well, well, when God's sitting on the throne, I mean, what are you going to do? Oh, sorry, don't talk about me being Jesus Christ, God of the universe. Sorry, Shh, keep that down. We've got to let these guys have their freedom. He doesn't care about that, right? You see how ridiculous the, 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 the whole mindset and the thought process is behind the political process as a whole? So when you, when, you, when you get people talking about that, it's going to be, the next year is just horrible. You might as well just delete your Facebook. I mean, it's just, you know how it goes. It's just political nonsense, just nonstop, one after another. And, and I, I like to get to the heart of the meat of those issues and ask people the questions. Well, hey, is there going to be religious freedom in the, in the kingdom of heaven? Do you think there will be separation of church and state in the kingdom of heaven? And you know what? I had one guy actually tell me yes. He told me, yes, absolutely there will be. I said, <laughs> don't even really know what to even say to that, right? There's, there's really no even discussion. That you can't talk to somebody that says that. They, they're, so, they're so delusional about, about the, the absolute truth and the demanding nature of the message of the cross and about Jesus Christ, right? I mean, he, he, he doesn't care about not being offensive, right? They call it the offense of the cross for, for a reason, right? So thinking about that, just, just keep that in mind when you're, when you're talking to individuals in the next couple weeks about the political process. And then just ask them another question that's very important, very important question. And just say, well, who would Jesus Christ vote for? <clears throat> There's an election. Jesus Christ is 31 years old. He's able to vote, let's say. And he's going he's gonna to vote for somebody. Who's he going to vote for? Can I assure you that he doesn't pick the lesser of any evils? Okay. Can, can I assure you that he's not going to lead men to other men, right, who, who, can, who can provide them with maybe some, you know, illusion of redemption, but he's going to lead all men and draw all men unto himself, where he can actually do what? Provide them true redemption from the fallen state of mankind in the world? They're all liars, okay? The only one that's not is Jesus Christ. 
So think about it just for a second. How, how ridiculous is the process? Well, we have to stand up for it. We have to defend it. Look, go home and Google the Electoral College. I mean, just, just go look that up. You think that the majority vote actually wins, the popular vote wins? It doesn't win. It doesn't matter anyways. Okay? It's all just garbage. It, 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 what, what president has ever been amazing that's just like changed the world? And can I assure you, too, that the presidents don't make any laws? They don't. Presidents don't make laws. When someone says, well, the president did this and that, and I said, that's called the legislature. You have a fundamental misunderstanding about how the government works. Because can I tell you, too, that the government wants people to be as dumb as they possibly can be because it doesn't benefit them to have educated people? You know why they do away with civics? And, do they even have civics anymore? I, I, I mean, it's like, it's pretty rare that they even teach it. And if, if so, they're going to teach you the very, you know, basic, minute portions of it. But the concept of civics is just going to be to, to keep people as, as at the level of being dumb, right, as they can be, because they need to continue to perpetuate. And so they say, well, who's they? Spiritual wickedness that worketh, <laughs> right? I mean, do you think that it's just, just, just happened by chance? No, right? So again, they, they, they like to make themselves out to be you know, religious uh, proponents of freedom, but the freedom that they're proposing is, uh, is actually really blasphemous, incredibly blasphemous. To stand up for, I don't care about religious freedom. I have zero care for religious freedom. Well, what do you mean? You're not going to be able to worship freely. I, I can do whatever I want to do, right? And the government cannot tell me not to worship religiously or freely. Even if they banned it, I'd still do it, right? And there's going to become a date and time and point in which they're going to do that. And then you're going to go, what are you going to do? Take the mark or not? I mean, really, you have to get into that. That's actually going to take place. It's going to occur. You know, I, I just, again, kind of just talking from the heart, but just think about that for a minute. <clears throat> so, present day, when it comes to the Sabbath day, do you know anybody that really adheres to it? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think you know anybody that actually does it. Okay? So in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 16, it says this. Colossians 2 and verse number 16, it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or drink, that is, what you should be eating or, or what you should be drinking. If you should be eating things, oh, that's something that was offered to an idol. I can't believe you drank it. Oh, you ate it. It's, it's making me. No, dude, it doesn't really matter. It's, all you do when you do that is you give the idol more power, right? You make the idol as if it has some power. It's dumb. It's a piece of wood. It's a piece of brass. It's a piece of metal. Who cares? I can eat whatever I want to eat. It doesn't matter. And you actually show great power in doing that in terms of your ability to, to understand uh, that it has no power. And he says, or in drink, or in respect of what? Notice this, of an holy day. So some day comes, well, this is the reverent day. You need to make sure you do this. Because, dude, there's a million feast days and high holy days going through the law of Moses. People don't even know half of them. You know, I mean, there's so many things. Who knows? I don't know them. I don't really care. I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but I just don't care because it's not for me. And one day maybe I'll get to it if I'm 60 years old and I've run out of things to read. But, you know, for now it doesn't really matter. And he says, or of the new moon. Or of, notice what he says, or of the Sabbath, and then he has the days in italics, <coughs> meaning it's added for reference purposes or understanding. Or of the Sabbath days. So think about that. Don't worry about it. Not really a big deal. No, 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 let no man judge you. So that means nobody can come in and say, you're not keeping the Sabbath day. It doesn't matter. Because I'm not keeping days and weeks and months and years and all of those things. It doesn't matter. So what do you do? Well, people will go, well, Jesus kept the Sabbath day, and I do everything Jesus does. No, you don't. No, you really don't. I promise you you don't. But look with me at, at Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, in verse number 23, it says this, And it came to pass, Mark 2, 23, And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold! Why do they do, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have you never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger, and he and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abathur, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priests, and gave also them which that were with him? And, and he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for who? The Sabbath was made for man. And not man for the Sabbath. What came first? Right? I mean, God made that Sabbath day for a specific purpose. And that was to show the, the, the nation of Israel, look, hey, there's a time for rest. 
There's a time for dependence upon God, especially in relation to the, the giving of the manna, right? But that rest is a time for you to reflect back and look upon what has been done, right? Take the time and go, hey, let me think about what, is, what, is, what has occurred because how busy you can get. Can you work seven days a week? Absolutely you can. If you ever worked seven days a week and you haven't had, a, if you ever worked like, you know, 10 or 15 days in a row and you didn't get a break, how miserable is that? It's horrible. I mean, that's a great way to get sick. You want to get sick? Just go work like 12-hour days for like five days and you'll get sick like next week because your body's just drained. It's drained, it's drained, it's drained. So he says in verse number 28, Therefore the Son of, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, what does that mean? The Son of, Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He created it. It's his day. He can do what he wants with it. Make sense? He's the one that's established it and not man. Going over to Luke chapter number 4, <clears throat> this is a demonstration of, of what Lydia was doing. It's the same thing. Luke chapter 4 and verse number 16, it says this. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, what did he do? He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. So it was common to go where? Into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Obviously, in where they were at there, they didn't have a synagogue or they're not, you know, there wasn't around or available to them. So they went out to the river to, to make prayer or to, to worship God. So going back to Acts chapter number 16, let's talk about this for a second. Who was with Paul at this present time? Who was with him? Timothy? Titus? Luke? <clears throat> Another guy named Silas, right? And who is this guy named Silas? Well, remember in Luke chapter 22, or Acts chapter 22, Luke writes that Silas was chief men among the brethren. Acts 15, 22. He's chief men among the brethren. He was a guy that was chief in there in the, in the, in the council at Jerusalem. And he was there with Paul to go and do what? To go and explain that, hey, the guys that supposedly came from us and were teaching you that you got to keep the law of Moses, as concerning and touching the Gentiles, we have written observed, concluded they observe no such thing, right? And he gives them the four things to tell them that, hey, hopefully that will help you out. You won't get too, you know, condemned about, you know, keeping, keeping the law of Moses for your eternal life. So Silas is here. So, but it says in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 14 that... Paul was the one that was doing the speaking. So notice it says, and she attended on the things which were spoken of by Paul. What did Paul preach? He preached that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, right? He preached that he was resurrected from the dead, and he preached the, you know, the forgiveness of sins or, you know, the justification of mankind through Jesus Christ. That's what he preached, the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, did Paul here perform the baptism when it says in verse 15, and she was baptized? I believe the answer to that question is no, because if you read uh, uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, he says that, uh, I'm sorry, the book of, uh, if you look at, look, at, look at 1 Corinthians first to start with. So 1 Corinthians written later on, after this point in time, so if he was going to reference who he baptized here in Acts, uh, or First Corinthians chapter one, he says in verse number fourteen, he says, "I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest uh, any of you should say that I had baptized in my own name, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other." Okay, pretty straightforward, right? He, he doesn't know if he baptized any other. So clearly, Lydia here was baptized by somebody else. Okay, who was it? I think the logical conclusion is likely Silas of all the individuals who were there, right? Likely Silas. He's chief men among the brethren. He's been with Peter. When Peter in Acts chapter 10 and they, you know, they go, hey, can any man forbid these guys water, right? After they had received the Holy Ghost. Remember, Peter has in his mindset about baptism that, okay, it's necessary. He's got this linking with the Holy Ghost. It's something that, you know, they, they get, right, upon the, the Holy Ghost baptism. And he goes, oh, wait, these Gentiles which believe... They already received the Holy Ghost, the sign of which was the same sign that they received at Pentecost, which was the speaking in tongues. So those Gentiles that were with Cornelius spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 10. All the Jews that were with him were astonished and amazed and said, oh my goodness, aren't these dudes Gentiles? How does this even happen? This is really weird. This is out of the ordinary. This is something completely new. And Peter, of course, going, hey, can any man forbid him water? Should we baptize him? I don't really know. I guess we'll just continue on with the progress of doing this water baptism. So in Acts chapter, or 1 Corinthians chapter 
1 and verse number 17, Paul makes this statement. And I want you to really think about this statement for a second. I mean, really, truly think about this statement. Notice what he says. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Just, just stop with that for just a second. I want you to just think about it. In the end of Matthew chapter 28, he says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Right? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you. I want you to reconcile this in your brain. Read this verse. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. I mean, it doesn't get any clearer than that, okay? I mean, it really doesn't. I just gave you two verses, Matthew 28 and verse number 20. He says, go ye into all the world, 28, 19, 20. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay. Baptizing them. Go, preach, baptize, teach. That's what the Baptists do today. They go and do it. They go out, preach the gospel. They get you wet, but hold on. Remember what I told you what they do. When do they get you wet? They have to take the act of baptism and they have to move it as far away from your salvation experience just so you don't mingle the two together. We don't want you to think that you're saved by your baptism because that would, that's not what we believe. So what we'll do is we'll take your baptism and make you complete the New Believers course. And once you've completed the New Believers course, and it's been a month or two, then we'll let you join the church after you get baptized. Right? You kind of familiar with that process? Some of you guys are just nodding your heads. Some of you are like, I don't really know what you're talking about. But if you're in the Baptist world, that's, that's what they do. And Baptists are the biggest proponents of baptism. They're, they're very, they do it you know, all the time. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 17, where he says, For Christ sent me, notice the phrase me, he can't, Paul can't say, For Christ sent Peter not to baptize. Okay? Can't, he can't say that. It's not possible. For Christ sent Silas not to baptize. I'm sorry, he can't say that either, right? Because Peter taught Silas, who then was a protege and listened to what the teaching of Peter was, right? I mean, that's just how it goes. If they're chief men among the brethren, clearly the apostles had taught these individuals and they were close to the apostles, right? So he cannot say that Christ sent any of the apostles not to preach the gospel either, or not to, not to, not to uh, baptize either, Right? Do you see how that works? Meaning that there, there's two things happening here. There's two individuals. There's Paul who's doing something, who has, has some... So now the question becomes, hold on a second, but why did he even allow it? Why did he allow it to go on, right? Why would Paul say, okay, we'll let Lydia be baptized. Why would he even let it go down? You know, it's a good question, but I think it's probably better, easier answer by this. Just imagine what's happening. Paul goes to Silas. Silas, you don't need to do that. <laughs> what? Have you ever heard what Peter said? We have to do this. This is, this is what we do. I mean, he's just like, well, let's go with the flow. Just, just, let's just do it. I mean, whatever. It, it really doesn't matter, but let's just go ahead and we'll, we'll baptize. Okay? So then they say, well, the next question is, why did he baptize Crispus and Gaius and the household of Stephanus? Why would he baptize any of them? Maybe they really wanted to be baptized. And actually, if you know who Crispus is, he was the chief, he was the, uh, uh, chief ruler of the synagogue. He was a Jew. And if you get into more detail, it seems like there's this big association with the Jews and the baptism. Well, like anything. You know what the Jews do with baptism? The same thing they did with circumcision, which is what? Ha ha, we got it, you don't. <laughs> we're better than you because we can do it and you can't because we're God's chosen people and you're not, right? So at the end of the day, let me ask you a question. What does baptism accomplish for you? Water baptism, what does it accomplish for you? The answer that people will say is very simple. It's keeping of the ordinances of the commands of God. Based upon what? Based upon Matthew chapter 28, right? I tell them always to turn to Mark 16. It's a typical cycle that I always do. The same thing. I say to go to Mark 16. Look at those passages. And it says, These signs shall surely follow them that believe. And then I read off all the signs. They say, That's not for today. And I say, Well, you're practicing dispensational thought, but you can't practice it in relation to baptism. You see how that works? They'll practice it on Mark 16. These signs shall surely follow them that believe. In my name they shall, and they go through all the things that they shall do, right? And they'll say, but that's not for me. That's not for today. You see how they can do it on certain things, but they can't do it on other things? It's interesting, isn't it? 
you know, Silas was likely following again the plan. The plan is Acts 2.38. I mean, he's, just, he's following what, what Peter has been teaching. He's following that, that issue. Same thing in Acts 10, 10, 47. Can any man forbid him water, right? I mean, just like the Sabbath, which they don't keep anymore, nobody keeps. <clears throat> it's not necessary, right? What, is, what does Paul say about the Sabbath? Let no man judge you concerning any holy day or any Sabbath day. What does he say about circumcision, right? Hey, hey whoa, whoa, circumcision was a big deal. If you weren't circumcised, geez, you weren't even a part of the covenant. That was part of the seal, man. How did, what are you talking about? It's not necessary, right? Circumcision, Paul says what? Profiteth you nothing. Zilch. Zero. And then the law. You're not underneath the law. You're under grace. And baptism can be, again, correlated in the same way. Let's make it very clear. As I said, baptism is not synonymous with water. Everybody always thinks it's water, it's water, it's water. Every time you get baptized, baptized, baptized. Have you ever baptized? What about baptism of water? And you're like, really? Have you ever thought about it that it may not be water and there might be something else? One of the best verses to do that in is over in the book of Luke, chapter number 12. We're almost done here. We've got to close up. But <coughs> In Luke chapter 12, in verse number 49, I would say, okay, so in the beginning of Luke, you know, it's in, it, it, right after the... Uh, uh, after he goes out with John the Baptist, you know, he gets, he gets what? He gets water baptized there, right? And, this, and the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove, and his face shone, and all the people saw him, and woo, he's Jesus, right? And he's baptized. Well, it's his water baptism, right? So then you read over here in Luke chapter 12, and he says this in verse number 50, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. That means that what? He hasn't been baptized yet. So what is this teaching you? It's just simply teaching you that there's something else other than water, Okay. You can learn this from Matthew 3, the, the very common verse that everybody teaches, you know. For I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, right? Neither of which are water. I've always joked around and said, well, how do you baptize with fire and water at the same time unless it's gasoline, right? I mean, that's pretty much the only way to do it. Get some gasoline, get some water, light it on fire, and baptize you in it, right? Because water puts out fire. So reading this, he says, but I have a baptism to be baptized. Says, well, what's he getting to? What's he saying? See, the, the issue of baptism says it's to go through something, right? And this here, as he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with. He says, and how am I straightened? That is, how is he, he is restrained, like a straitjacket, till it be accomplished? Meaning he would like to do certain things, but he says, I can't do them until this happens. What is this baptism that he has to go through? Well, it's his death, as we read. We read those verses in Mark chapter number 10 last week. Mark 10, of those verses. And he says in Mark 10, verse number 38, he says, You know not what you ask, can you drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, yes, we can, right? And Jesus said, and then you shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, ye shall be baptized. What is that? Turn with me to Romans chapter number 6. Verse number 1. What shall we say then? Because apparently it, the law entered that the offense might abound, and apparently, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Well, then how shall we, that are dead to sin, apparently, from what you've told us, live any longer therein in our dead, nasty, filthy bodies, which are all filled with sin? How does that even work? Don't make no sense. Don't get it. I don't understand it. He's saying, look, hold on, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, Christ. Now, notice that phrase. As many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ. Notice again the phrase, as many as us were baptized into Jesus Christ. Does anybody here know how to put people into Jesus Christ? Because I do. You know how you do it? By faith. And through the operation of God. And God does it through the Spirit. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. That's how it occurs. God does it. He actually, he, by, the, you notice that phrase, operation of God, as he says? Through faith, the operation of God, that's the functionality. We can go to those verses here in just a second. But 
uh, Colossians 2.12. Look what he says. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ. Because we're baptized into Christ, we get to participate in his baptism that he talked about. Remember that one? The baptism that you get to participate in. The one that you actually want to participate in. Which is what? He says, we're baptized into his baptism. Death, because if you're baptized into Christ, you're put into Christ, and all the things that Christ has accomplished, you get to partake in. And which is what? His death. And he goes, therefore, as a result, what happened? We were buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The Baptists say this. Bury with him in baptism into death, raised to walk in newness of life. I present you my brother in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. I mean, that's what they do. They just say, it's like a rhetoric that they say. And you go, what is it accomplishing? What do they think happens? What, what, what really occurs in that ceremony? And if that's important, we should be doing that. We should probably also be doing circumcision, too, on the eighth day. And be, be real staunch about that. And we should probably cancel our Sunday services and start those things up at Friday at sundown. But we won't do that stuff. That's just... But that's not, that's, not, that's not what we need to be doing. Look one verse with me at Colossians chapter 2.12, and then we'll, we'll pick up next week. <clears throat> Colossians 2.12, look what he says. Verse 9, he says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Oh, man, I'm getting confused. How do I get in there? How does this work? I need to make sure I'm in there. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom, notice all these things are about being in Christ, right? Remember what he says? You're buried with him. As many as we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into his death. Well, how do I get in him? I need to figure out how this works. Notice what he says. In whom also ye are circumcised. Uh-oh. Where? Should I get, do I need to go get circumcised? No, 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 hold on. Hey, wait, wait. In whom you're also circumcised with well, a circumcision made without hands. Notice what he says. In the putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, which is what? You're not going to get circumcised. We already told you that. You get to participate in the, in the true circumcision, right? Paul says in Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number one, 1, 2, and 3, he says that we are the circumcision, right? Who have no confidence in the flesh. And the flesh has nothing to do. He goes what he says. Notice what he also goes on to say. He says, buried with him in baptism, which is what he's just telling you about, this, this whole thing, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith. Notice this. Again, read the verse. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, meaning it's something that God does, not man. Men don't put you into the body of Christ. Men cannot put you into Christ. Men cannot make you join the church. Right? Just because of the little baptism thing, and I, and I jokingly said, I never, I went to Indian Rocks Baptist Church for several years, three or four years, and they never let me join the church. They said I had to get rebaptized. And I was like, well, I'm not getting rebaptized. He said, yeah, you got to rebaptize. I said, I was baptized at Citrus Park, First Baptist Church at Citrus Park, by Dr. Harold Warner in 1990. So I've already been baptized. I'm good. And they said, no, you have to get it. And, they, and I said, well, what do you need? Well, I have to see your baptismal certificate from, from First Baptist Church of, of, uh, of, of Citrus Park. I said, dude, that place, I don't even know if they had it. Probably don't even keep those records. I'm like, I'm sure as heck not calling them up. Hey, man, can you give me your baptism certificate from 1990? They're like, sir, this is 20 years later, you know? Well, what am I going to do with that? How, how, is it that? how is it that these individuals will, will, will use baptism? Well, it becomes, for them, it becomes something they can do in their flesh. It's a party. I mean, how many times people have baptism parties? I mean, think about the kids who get baptized. Oh, we're having our bat. Oh, my son's getting baptized this week. It's going to be great. I'm like, what, what's going on? They have a party. Baptism party. When they're little kids, too. Like, what is that all about? What are you doing for them? What's that even do? You get them wet? You baptize them every day in the shower, don't you, or in the bathtub? Notice what he says. Buried with him in baptism, wherein you're also risen with him through what? Through the faith of the operation of God. I wish I knew more back then. I could have told the guy, but look, I was already baptized into Christ through faith of the operation of God. God did all this for me. By one spirit, we all baptized into one body. So that's how it worked. And they're going to be like, wow, I mean, you still got to get the certificate. And my wife, unfortunately, she was kind of mad at me at the time. And she was like, well, I want to join the church. I want to make sure we join. I'm like, well, unfortunately, they're not going to let me join. So she's like, well, I'm going to go get baptized. Because she was baptized as a kid and she, at the Methodist church. So then she's going to get rebaptized. So she got water baptized at, at, out at a... Uh, at the beach with 4,000 other people, you know. So, 
Read the verse. Through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. God put you into him. God resurrected him. God did everything. And he says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, and he hath quickened, quickened together with him after you got in that water and got cleaned up. Right? Make sure you get in it. Clean it up. Now, it's the same way we look at circumcision, right? People say, man, you're being real flippant with the baptism thing. You're being flippant with it. You're being kind of sarcastic. I'm, I am because it's the same thing as circumcision. We're really flippant about circumcision now, right? Because it don't matter. And people get all up in arms. Well, they, you know, baptism for the most part, say, yeah, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to get circumcised. Don't worry about that, right? But you touch their baptism, you're like, uh, you're insulting their mother. I mean, they don't like that. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath be quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Look, even Peter gets it. Read 1 Peter 3.21. I think I had time to look at that verse. He says, baptism. He's like, it ain't about, he says, wherein the like figure doth now also save. That's what he says. Wherein the like figure doth now also save. He goes, even baptism. He goes, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of God according to good conscience. Right? You understand what he's saying there? He's saying, it's not, it's not the, he <laughs> I wish I had time. I really do. I'm 50 minutes, 51 minutes in. But the answer of the conscience toward good God, that is when an individual understands the purpose of baptism through the kingdom program, it makes a lot more sense. Dude, look, the answer that the king, they go, well, the kingdom program, why do they have to get baptized in the kingdom program? Look, they were doing this all the way back in the Exodus. When they came out of Egypt, right, and they said, God's going to come and see you, and he's going to come and visit you, right? What do they say to do? He says, go get washed up. Go get cleaned up. Okay? They got baptized. That is their baptism. When the priests would do their duties, they would have to go get washed, and they would go get baptized. You know how many washings and baptisms that we see? Look, the baptism is a washing for, for, for uh, uh, like, as I would say, it's for, for washing for purification, right? It's to show the purification. That's what washing does. You wash your hands. Hey, you can't touch the baby yet. You got to wash your hands, right? We do it all the time. You do, dude, did you wash your hands before you ate, right? That's all that stuff, the washing for purification, that results in, as he says, sanctification as being set apart. And ultimately, when you're set apart, what do you have? You have a new identification. You're not what you used to identify or associate yourself with. So the baptism that we get associated with, the baptism into Christ, is for purification. You're baptized into Christ, which purifies you. It completely takes away all of your sin. 100%. He puts you through the baptism process, through Christ, which takes away every piece of sin that you have. You're resurrected. He says he's delivered for your offenses raised again for your justification. And so as a result of that, now you're sanctified. You're set apart. You're, you're not like the world anymore. You're different. And what is your new identification? Well, as he says, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus chapter number two. All right, let's close. 52 minutes. Thanks. All right, dear Lord.